Again, welcome everyone to our Smart Council webinar. Tonight our topic is about the real estate market. Um, I want to tell you a little bit about our firm and our panelists. So I'm Suzanne Sayward, a partner with the law firm of Samuel Sayward and Baylor here in Dedham. We concentrate our practice in the areas of estate planning, elder law, estate and trust administration, and probate. For those of you who have been with us for a while, you know that we would hold these smart counsel uh, programs every few months in our office here in Dedham. We always had a good time. We had some wine. We had some cheese. Now you have to have your own wine and cheese, but we <laughs> hope that, you know, sometime um, soon we will have people, people back in the office. <clears throat> So um, just to give you a heads up though, our next Smart Council program will still be a webinar. That will be in October and the focus will be on probate. What's it all about? How to avoid it? Why is it so hideous? So we hope that you'll join us for that and we uh, watch your email for more news about that. So let me talk a little bit again about tonight's program, which is on the booming real estate market. What do you need to know if you're a seller or a buyer or you want to be a seller or a buyer or um, you have friends or neighbors or children who, who might want to get into that market, as well as what if you're, you or someone in your family is facing a situation where you might need to leave your long-term home and, and maybe move to a smaller home or assisted living or some other type of um, housing. So we're going to cover all of that and I'm going to talk a little bit about what if your house is in trust or what are, what are the tax aspects of selling, selling property. So we'll cover those and tonight I want to introduce our panelists. Um, on my view, Janice Littman and Ellen Grupert are at the bottom, and they are from the <laughs> Ellen and Janice team. Um, they are based in the Boston area and have been helping people buy and sell residential real estate for more than 20 years. They have a team of realtors who work with them and cover the eastern, eastern Massachusetts, I think we, we, we thought was a good description. Um, and up above, I have Adam Hayes, and Adam and I have known each other for way long, uh, going back to Adam's previous life before he was a realtor. Adam spent many years in customer service jobs, including restaurants and sales, um, and uh, launched his real estate practice or business in 2009, after spending a long, frustrating time helping his dad uh, transition from a longtime home to uh, an assisted living and eventually skilled nursing facility where he, he needed more help. But the trying to cobble together the resources and uh, find out information about how to deal with property with someone who's been there forever, um, other situations that Adam's encountered over the years and he'll talk to us about is one if you have a reverse mortgage, one if you've been on mass health, one if you're incapacitated and trying to sell property. So our format tonight is going to be me peppering our panelists with all sorts of questions. Um, I'm gonna start with Ellen and Janice who will talk a little bit about the market in general and give us a, a flavor of what's going on. Um, and then talk, Adam will, will chime in and we'll talk a little bit more about these specific issues um, that come up for people who are transitioning out of their long-term homes. And then I'll talk a little bit, as I said before, about selling or buying property and trusts and the tax, tax aspects. And who knows, um, Ellen and Janice and Adam may decide to pepper me with questions. So <laughs> who knows? Um, if you have questions, please uh, put them into the Q&A or the chat feature on the Zoom and we'll uh, get to the, to the questions at the end. Um, we anticipate that we'll spend about 20 minutes or so on each of our um, topics and then take the, take the uh, questions at the end. All right, so Ellen and Janice, first of all, Give us a little sense about what's going on out there. It, it feels like it's crazy. Are we right? 
So, you know, it's been a very interesting and challenging real estate market. Um, crazy has been the word of the day, but real estate market has been ebbing and flowing. Um, with COVID, um, more and more people were like, I need more space, I need more home, I need to buy a larger home. And so an inventory was down. And so that created quite a bit of a feeding frenzy on the buying side and the selling side, very, very low inventory, interest rates very low. So it's been crazy. Interesting enough, at this moment, we're still very busy, but there's been a little bit in July timeframe of a slowdown. So we're not as frenetic and we're not as crazy as it's been, but it's still very busy. Um, there's been a shift in the market. There's low, a little bit, there's still low inventory, particularly for single family homes. Condominiums, however, are ticking up. Um, so there is a, a little bit more inventory out there. We're seeing multiple offers on single family homes, but not what you were hearing that there were, you know, eight offers, 10 offers, 15 offers. Um, yeah, I, there's like three and five or two and three. Right, I put an Ooh. offer in on a single family home just a couple of days ago and we were one of two offers. So okay. if you're a buyer that's been sitting on the sideline thinking, oh my goodness, I can't possibly buy a home at this time things are starting to shift a little bit more in your direction. So have you, so Ellen, you mentioned the, that there's a tick up in the, in the um, or I'm sorry, Janice, you mentioned there's a tick up in the, in the condo um, availability. Is that mostly in, in the city of Boston or uh, where, where, are you, where are you seeing that? We're, I, oh, go ahead, sorry. Uh, no, it's been neighborhoods of Boston and, and surrounding areas as well. Um, so if you look at inventory in Brookline or Newton, um, those areas that still do have, in addition to a single family home market, a condominium market, those numbers have increased and places are staying on the market a bit longer. What, what's happened in the market now is that with COVID restrictions easing a little bit, sellers that were concerned about putting their single family home on the markets have put their single family homes now on the market. So condo owners are finding that they can now buy their single and now they can sell their condo. So with a little bit more inventory, there's been a little bit more condo inventory because there's more single family inventory. So it's been a cycle. So that is a challenge. You know, we, we don't do uh, real estate, uh, law here, although in the past we have back in the in the 80s and even the 90s. And, and I know that um, trying to sell and buy simultaneously um, is a challenge. If you are a person who, who is trying to buy up and, and you've got a house and you're counting on that money to put down on, on your new home, uh, you know, that's very nerve wracking and, and also logistically can be, can be difficult. And I would imagine in this market makes you perhaps not as attractive a buyer. So tell us a little bit about that situation, what you're seeing there and are there any tricks or tips that people can, can take from that? So, you know, there's a couple of things. First and foremost, you know, planning ahead as best as possible is always key. So we will meet with prospective seller buyers to see about their finances. If you've owned property for a very long time, there are options to get a potential bridge loan or a line of credit. Because most of the time, if you own a home, you're looking to bridge the gap of the money that you're going to sell your current resident for to bridge the gap for the other purchase. So we work with them on lines of credit and giving them some advice on that piece of the puzzle. A lot of parents help out until they sell their condo so they can make their purchase. Um, if you don't have the wherewithal to do that, there are sometimes opportunities where you put your current home on the market. This is not a fair complete with the hopes that your buyer will give you um, uh, use and occupancy for up to two months that rent would allow back. a rent back that would allow you to close on your condo, stay there, and hopefully find your home. In this market, that's been challenging with low inventory, so you need to have a plan. What happens if I don't find something? Can I sleep on someone's couch? Mm -hmm. um, but we really with try all to my stuff. 
Exactly. We try to map it out as best as possible. We've had many couples that we've met with, you know, three years, five years, and they started this plan and they built up enough equity in their condo. So now they were able to finally make that move. Yeah, the plan B is super important. Um, if you don't have that plan B, um, you need to know, and you need those funds out of the place you're living, um, it could get a little tricky. So either having that family member that can step in or the loans, as Ellen alluded to, it would really be very helpful to know um, that information in advance. But if we meet with somebody with enough time, we can map it out for them and we have a, and some like we have a seller that just closed on a property and she was able to get an offer accepted subject to her sale so some states hmm. and she was moving to rhode island so some states will allow a contingency purchase not all some it depends on the situations at hand um but we'll definitely be mindful and work with everybody. We don't have a timeline or an agenda for anybody, so we make sure they understand all the parts and pieces before getting into it. So if, if someone's a first-time buyer and they don't have um, family behind them that can come up with a, you know, either a cash to, to buy something or even a really large deposit, you know, say they're just your your run of the bill, I got 10% I can put down on this $250,000 condo. Is, is there any hope for that, that person? Well, I don't know if there are any $250,000 condos, but um, <laughs> <laughs> there is All right, hope. so if they're in a cushnet. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So there is, there is absolutely hope. You know, a lot of today's buyers don't have, because of student loans and whatnot, young buyers don't have a big um, they don't have a lot of money cash flow, but they have very good credit scores and they have very good incomes and they're paying, you know, rentals are $4,000, three, four, dollars $5,000 a month, depending on where you are. So you can afford the monthly. So if you have good credit and you have a good income, you can still find many people that are buying things at 95% financing, 90% financing. The challenge has always been when it's been competitive mm. because then a seller will accept something that's a higher down payment or a cash offer. So, but we've had many buyers and they would get their offers accepted with 95% financing, 90% financing. It is available to them. Buyers are nervous to jump in, but why are you spending $3,000 a month on a rental if you can buy something? So we That's a really happen. good point. And that's very encouraging to hear that, yes, it is, it is possible. Um, can, can either of you talk a little bit about, you know, what's, what's the financing world out there? We all know the, the mortgage rates are great. Are people able to get their financing, you know, relatively easy? You apply for a mortgage and you can get that done within, you know, three to five weeks? Oh, yes, absolutely, especially when they take our recommendations for lenders to work with. Um, we know, you know, we've vetted them over the years and we've worked with them and we know, you know, we don't get anything for referring them other than the satisfaction that they're going to do a good job. So we have some lenders that can really close a loan within four weeks. Um, so, you know, from offer accepted, you know, they get their application in right away um, and the wheels... Uh, you know, are in motion, and they can get their loan approved. Um, Condo, if, oops, sorry. No, 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 I was just going to say, so, so we have a list of lenders that, you know, that are terrific, and that we've worked with for a long time. And, and That's you know, right. condos take a little bit longer, it could take four to six weeks to close a single, you could close as quick as three, four weeks. It depends on how busy everybody is. So June was a very busy month. So lenders were behind because appraisers were behind. Mm. But as we're less busy, it, it will move quicker. You know, we have a good list, but we also know the good, we call them the good, the bad, the ugly. Like you, <laughs> not everyone's going to use everybody on our list, but as long as we know who they are, there are great lenders out there. And then there's ones you have to worry about. And so right. it just, it varies. Yeah, yeah. So let's talk a little bit from the seller side. So say I'm a seller and I want to realize the best price for my property, whether it's a condo or a single family, what, what should I do? 
besides hire you. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, you know, we will go in and we will meet with the seller and we will help you do, um, Janice really does this, what we call the honeydew list. And we will help you get ready for staging so your home looks as good as humanly possible. Even though it's a strong seller's market, you never, in our estimation, want to take anything for granted. You want to put out a product that buyers will want to buy. Young buyers don't want to lift a screwdriver. So we need to also potentially help them with fixing things as well. And our company has com Compass Concierge, which will actually help any repairs and staging, and we will lay out the money up front, and then we get reimbursed at closing. So if there's a cash flow issue, we can help you get ready. And then we, you know, we run comps and market analysis. We see a lot of the competition and we help garner what we feel is the best list price to garner the most buyers through. You know, the interesting thing about the market is that now so many people have access to the data. You know, I mean, it used to be years ago, it was very um, sort of concealed, I guess, but now it's really front facing for the consumer. But how you analyze that data, and the one thing Ellen and I pride ourselves on is that we see almost every single property. And, you know, Zillow might have a number attached to a property, but it's all based on algorithms and they've never been inside that property. So they have no idea. Um, and it's nuanced. So you have to take that data and really analyze it to its fullest to make sure that you are, you know, coming up with a price position for your seller that's going to seem like good value. Buyers are going to be attracted to their home because we're going to showcase it in the best light possible, get as many people through the door. And if we're fortunate enough to get multiple offers, that's what will push that price even higher than what our list price is. Do you, are you finding um, unreasonable sellers? People who say, <laughs> my house is worth a million dollars, but it's really only worth it's a uh, <laughs> of course, right? I mean, everyone's reading the real estate market is hot, hot, hot. It's a sales market. We could just, you know, we don't have to paint. We don't do anything. And of course, um, and we don't always then we'll work together because there are some agents that will say yes to an unreasonable price, no matter what. And we refer in the industry called like, it's basically like they're buying the listing. Um, and we don't want to work. We want to work with people that really want to work together collaboratively. Um, and if a seller is unreasonable, we'll say, show us the data. Like, here's the data. I'm, it's not a mystery. How did you come up with this? Help me out. And we'll try to work together. But if they're unreasonable, you know, we probably won't work with them ultimately. Yeah, there's no reason to take a listing and just have it sit yeah. on the yeah. market. Do, so get out your crystal ball. <laughs> and, and tell us, tell us what you think is, is, is you know, where, where is this trending? Where is this going? Who's going to be able to afford to, to, to live anywhere? Well, I think that the, you know, the, the key economists that are out there, particularly uh, as it relates to housing, are saying that the market is going to stay strong. It's going, there's still a ton of pent up demand from the last several years. Um, Interest rates, you know, they thought maybe we're going to tick up a little bit, but they've actually ticked back down a little bit. Um, interest rates, they think, are going to stay fairly steady around 3%, which, of course, if you're as old as we are, you know that's unheard of. <laughs> um, so, and, you know, and there are a lot of buyers who have been sitting on the sidelines that will be entering the market. You know, and the one thing about Boston is that it's, in the Boston area, I should say, it's very transient. You know, people really do come and go, and, you know, a lot of kids come up here for school and end up getting a job and staying, and then parents realize this crazy amount of rent is not worth paying and help them out to buy their first home. And then there's other people that are just moving all over the country for, you know, jobs who are now with COVID, they realize, oh my goodness, I could work from home and I don't need to be right here and I can go live someplace else where perhaps the cost of housing is less. 
then um, I'm selling my house right. and I'm leaving. But, but we think it's going to be stable. I mean, we don't really know if we're going to continue with the multiple offers like we're seeing. If inventory comes on, then we're going to be more of a even a balanced, balanced market. So, um, but we do anticipate that 2022 will be strong is what everyone is saying and what we're seeing because July is still busier than other Julys have been and even into August. So, but time will tell with everything going on in the world right, right. now, you know, yeah. so. Right. Um, good. All right. Well, I'm going to uh, move on to some questions for, for Adam. And um, Adam, maybe just start off by telling us a little bit about the special challenges that someone who has lived in their home for, you know, 30, 40 years and, and now um, is, is elderly, perhaps even, and, and not quite as, as energetic and robust as they used to be. And, and now they're realizing, oh, you know, maybe this house is too big for me or my children are badgering me to, to go live somewhere else. Um, so what, what, are the, what are the major things that you see in that, uh, in that uh, community? Thank you, Sue. Thanks for this opportunity. A lot of people just don't recognize that there are niches in this industry, like many industries. I've chosen to work with the senior population because that's how I was brought up. My grandmother lived next door. If she needed something or her friend needed something or her friend's friend needed something, I better do it or it wasn't a good scene when I got home, my dad would have something to say about it. What I discovered in um, real estate is that there's a lot of agents who get a license and it's a license to ruin people's lives. Just because you passed the test does not mean that you're really qualified. The business itself as I experienced firsthand with my own parents who were my inspiration. Um, I had to move my dad from an unsafe living situation back in 2001. And it, it was a very different time. There weren't a lot of options the way they are now. So I don't want to contrast too much, uh, but there weren't a lot of supports that were readily available. And what I ran into and what I think is the big mistake is in our industry, we're taught that it's all about location, location, location. And I just don't see it that way. I see it as it's the client, the client, the client. So a lot of my clientele is compromised physically, sometimes mentally. It's complicated. Everyone would agree. Many times the client has waited too long mm. and mm -hmm. they're not safe living on their own anymore. That's what happened with my dad. And I'm going to tell you that it's the typical lawyer response. No, I don't mean anything bad, but it depends, right? Every single case is a little bit different. There are times when I've had to literally hold hands with an adult special needs child because he grew up in that house and mom fell and broke her hip and it just goes downhill rapidly. That's not the glamorous part of this business that you see on TV. And when you do see it on TV, it's a bit of a spectacle and it really irks me. Um, Hoarding is a psychological disorder. I, I, I have a lot of problems with how the elderly and infirmed are treated. I, I'm not trying to reinvent anything. I'm just trying to be the best advocate that I can be because I feel that everyone deserves good representation, not just the glitzy house that, you know, most of my properties don't look good. Sometimes they don't smell good. I've dealt with houses where there are chalk outlines. It, it gets rough, but yeah, you're, you're dealing with these people who need help. And I just firmly believe that it's wrong to dance around the vulnerable population. 
So if, if you were contacted by someone who needed to sell their home and say it was a situation, not even going to hoarding, but just, you know, they've lived in this house for, for 30 or 40 years and it's chock full of all of their stuff and their kids' stuff who now live in California and, you know, and, and the stuff that's just been dropped off there and, and never left. So, so what, where do you go with that? What, what, what are the resources? So yeah, stuff, right? It's just, oh my word. Um, it, I think Ellen and Janice will agree with me. What a talented agent brings to the table is you act as the general contractor of that client's life for a period of time, but mm -hmm. it's very intimate. And when you're dealing with uh, bottles of prune juice and makeup and fur coats and silk pajamas and 70 years of National Geographic magazines, there, there's a wide variety. And I do not put my value system on anybody. There are resources to have properties cleaned out. There are more responsible resources that will recycle where they can. There are, there's a cottage industry of clean out people who own resale shops so that they do anything they can to keep your belongings out of a landfill. Mm -hmm. um, it, it's, it's very, so it's like you said earlier, Janice and Owen, so it's like we're putting pieces of a puzzle together. Who's the right vendor? Who, which client needs someone who's more grandmotherly? Who needs someone who's more strict? Having a broad-based Rolodex only helps you. And if you give all your business to one vendor, and I think we've all seen it, some agents just do that, it's, maybe it's not serving the client's best interest. So I have been known to fill up the pickup truck with stuff. If, they, if a grandson, this has happened to me so many times, don't worry, Adam, I'll take everything out of the basement before the walkthrough. And you get to the walkthrough and it's all there. Um, it's not a good use of my time to clean out a property, but um, matching up the right declutterer clean out person with the owner or the um, whoever's in charge, actually the client, because a lot of my clients are the attorney or a remote sibling or family member, loved one, as you said earlier. So making that match so that everybody feels heard because as soon as someone feels that the vendor didn't pay attention, what do you mean that Yadro vase ended up at, at Goodwill? What, what do you mean, what? It, it, gets, it gets complicated. I would imagine that would happen every single time. You're not wrong. <laughs> oh. <laughs> um, so, having vendors with a great sense of humor really helps. You got it. I would think you would have to. Um, so sometimes when people are older and they're staying in their home, one of the things they might do is to take a reverse mortgage. And for people who are, who are attending and aren't quite sure what that is, um, it, it's being able to take money out of your house kind of like a home equity line of credit, except that you don't have to pay it back. It gets paid back either when you move and sell your home or when you pass away. So it can, it can provide either a lump sum of money to someone who wants to stay in their home, but the home needs repairs that they don't have the resources for. And this is not unusual in, in, in this, in this uh, in, in Massachusetts where we live. You know, somebody's lived in their home in Newton for 40 years. Now that home is worth a million dollars. Their real estate taxes are really high. It's falling down a little bit and they, they just don't have the money, even though they have this very expensive resource, they'd like to stay in their home. So a reverse mortgage can provide a, a lump sum of money for that. It, it can also uh, provide monthly income for people who want to stay in their home and maybe need some caregiving that they can't afford to, to pay for. So, so when, when people have a reverse mortgage, does it complicate the sale? So it depends. There are several flavors. There's two different varieties of reverse mortgages. I don't want to be 
to pontificate about the value of them. I've seen both sides of the coin where elderly clients took out a reverse in the early 2000s, got to stay in their home until they couldn't and made out like bandits. Like they literally got way more money than ever would have happened. And I've seen uh, in the last two years, um, four cases I was not able to help. N nobody was able to help because they got complicated by very, very large reverse mortgage lump sums. Properties fell into um, benign neglect, deferred maintenance. There's some niceties there. Um, and then Mass Health got involved. And when you have a mass health lien, I mean, you, you do know this, so when you have a mass health lien on top of a reverse mortgage, there is a whole different set of fiduciary duties that come into play. And there may actually not be any equity whatsoever, even in this robust environment, to sell the property and come out, uh, uh, even breaking even. Doing a short sale, I've done two of them in 15 years. They're miserable experiences. Reverse mortgage short sales are insanely complicated. Um, most of the time in my experience, if you're saddled with a giant reverse payoff and a large mass health lien, it may make economic sense to walk away. Mm. That is sad. It's not what we're in the business to do. And there is nothing nefarious about it, but that's a really difficult egg to work with. Yeah, the, you know, one of the issues with the reverse mortgage is unlike a traditional mortgage that, you know, Ellen and Janice were talking about earlier with these great rates, um, the reverse mortgage rates are typically pretty, pretty high. So the, the, uh, the outstanding balance can really balloon quickly, especially if it's a, if it's a large sum to start with. And now it's, uh, you know, you've got an 8% interest rate on it, it can get um, bad. Yeah, it's sad. It's, that's, a, that's a bad situation. Um, and of course, we see that from time to time as well. Um, so that's, that's difficult. I mean, nobody, um, as you know, nobody gets harmed. The heirs are not responsible. Right. If there's a money-making opportunity, you certainly you should have you should have some kind of analysis done to understand where it is in the marketplace but you're on a timeline as you know you get 6 months from the date that the occupant leaves and you can trigger another 6 months you get 12 months you know lenders do not want to be in the real estate business no uh, there's lots of shuffling around there are ways out. It just depends on what that balance is. Yeah, that's a, that's a good point. Good point. Um, so one of the things that I think all of you have alluded to a little bit is when you're thinking about selling your house um, and you want it to look its best, it, investing, investing money into the home how how far do you go? Um, you know, do you do you paint? Do you have the floors redone? Do you redo the kitchen? I mean, what what's what's sort of reasonable? And maybe all of you guys can talk a little bit about that. I mean, I'll start with you, Adam, because again, your situation might be more of maybe there's there there a lot of the houses that you're selling for elderly people maybe tear downs and and the advice may be do nothing um but you know uh, what what are the things that couldn't that make sense to do and what are the things that don't make sense so not not to be trite but it depends so <laughs> so here's the thing um i, I who's going to pay for it so if if the family if the owners are funded, that's, that's one thing. If there's no money, okay, we have to just think about who is going to front that money. That's easy to figure out. What's not so easy to figure out is in real estate, you know, time is of the essence. And that really 
couldn't be more to the heart. When you have a client who's no longer safe on their own and needs to make that move, you don't necessarily have the luxury of time to make any fixes whatsoever. Mm -hmm. Beyond that, to me, the subtlety is performing your fiduciary duty is that you limit the amount of liability to your client everywhere you're able as a non-attorney. If you make a repair, you own that repair. Now, we can all agree, I think, that anybody can be sued for anything, so I'm not being Pollyanna about this, but if your client pretend, this happens all the time, they have fuses instead of circuit breakers, somebody decides, oh, let's update the panel, I have uh, my brother-in-law's nephew mm -hmm. just graduated from trade school. He can do it for cheap. Okay, just pretend <laughs> something happens. There's a loss of property from the next buyer, loss of life. I mean, you have opened yourself up for no reason to just a neon sign of sue me. Now, I know I'm exaggerating, but you, you can draw your own parallels. Paint is innocuous. I don't think that could cause any problem. But where do you stop? And thinking about um, a fresh coat of Navajo white or whatever the in vogue uh, shade, off-white shade is this year, um, that's great. But now, have you actually done anything? So here's the question I honestly ask almost every single client who's a family member. I do an analysis, here's the math, if we sell as is, here's the math, if you make these improvements, right. mm -hmm. here's my advice, and I suggest you follow it unless it's cathartic for you to perform this painting, fix something because Aunt Mabel wanted you to, you owe it to her. I've heard all different variations, <laughs> just cut that because if, if then there's something deeper going on and you have to let that client work through their grieving. What would you say are the top three things to do to um, enhance the property value that gets you your best return on investment? Uh, yeah, so, well, sometimes we'll call that smoke and mirrors um, or lipstick on, you know, on, yeah. a pig. on a pig or <laughs> But what you're trying to do is really make it look as great as possible. I think what Adam was alluding to, you know, just fixes that just so-and-so can do or not anything we ever suggest. Um, we work with an arsenal um, of licensed contractors. Um, and so if it makes sense to make those kinds of improvements um, and take it, you know, but but the, the top three would be paint, floors, um, and sort of any life safety issues that could be a potential for the next buyer. Um, so you're trying to do, it is smoke and mirrors and sometimes it's lipstick on a, a pig, so to speak. You would never you very rarely are going to renovate a kitchen or a bathroom because then your buyer is going to be like, your seller is going to be like, I wish I did that. And it's too much money. Um, you want the buyer to feel like the next buyer that's buying that I could live here now and make my improvements. I could move in here. It's clean. It's neat. It looks good. It's safe. That's so those are kind of the top um, three. Um, and it depends also. <laughs> and where we're selling, you don't, you really don't really want an empty house. So we, so we do staging. recommend staging. I mean, it really is proven that, you know, in photos, if you see furniture or when you arrive at a property and there's furnishings, you can envision yourself living there and it makes a big difference. Yeah, I can, I can see that. Um, so one of the things that sometimes happens in, you know, when, in, in our business, when we're doing estates, for example, is I get all sorts of solicitations. You know, as soon as we file the probate, somebody's sending me a letter saying, I want to buy that property kind of thing. So, you know, so, so Adam, I would think that also when you've got older people 
who, you know, maybe the neighbors or their neighbor's kids or whatever start sort of sniffing around and saying, oh, old Mrs. Jones, she can't last that much longer. Maybe we could, you know, talk to her daughter and buy her house. So, uh, so what, what do you say when, you know, you're talking to somebody and they're like, oh, my next door neighbor is going to buy it for, you know, $200,000 and I don't have to pay a commission to the realtor. Doesn't that sound like a great idea? <laughs> Not to me. <laughs> <Us either. laughs> um, you know, I, I want to give people the benefit of the doubt, but I really, when it, when it comes to a vulnerable population, I believe that advocacy is what we need to put first. A broker by definition is a buffer. It's some, someone as a go-between, a middle person. If you are negotiating directly with the buyer, especially the silent generation, that's most of my clientele, um, if you're having an off day, or even if you're having a great day, they might be having a better day. You've lost some edge. Aside from that, um, you, the client may very well want to sell the property to the next door neighbor who always mowed his or her lawn. Like there, there could be an innocent, lovely fairy tale reason, but how do you get to the closing table? And how are you assured that you didn't leave money on the table? That is part of our obligation. You don't have to have an agent. I, I think that's common knowledge. People can sell a property on their own. It's just the unknown. And where we're in um, a robust or a tempestuous market right now, you make assumptions and you wanna believe that the neighbor has your best interest at heart. But here's, here's the thing, if, if the client, if, if the client is a decedent, okay, and it's a family member who's now been appointed personal representative, someone who has um, a fiduciary component or they're a conservator or a guardian, you have to put the house on the fair market. Uh, you have to air it out. And with mass health, I don't know how many people know the secret sauce, but you, you have to leave that house on market for six days. You're, you're, you're subject to a lot of scrutiny if you take that first offer on day one or day zero, as I've seen, which makes no sense to me at all. So it depends, sorry, who is the seller? What's the seller's motivation? And who is the seller accountable for? You have to check all the boxes. People make, I'm sure you could tell us quite a few stories, Sue, of people who've made grievous errors that they kick themselves after um, because they thought they were doing the right thing. And there's huge ramifications later on. I, uh, back in the day when uh, we used to do uh, real estate here, I remember once being at a closing and I think it was the other lawyer who said, well, the buyer's unhappy, the seller's unhappy, it was clearly a great deal. <laughs> <laughs> Hence why you don't do real estate law. That's <laughs> yes, but I think they were referring to the buyer thought they paid too much, the sellers thought they got too little. So obviously they were, you know, <laughs> they, they had come to the right price kind of thing. But right. um, so Adam's comment about, you know, what, what happens when you're uh, selling as the personal representative via an estate or as the trustee of a trust where uh, somebody has passed away or as a conservator. So uh, those, those are fiduciary roles, meaning that you're not doing this for yourself. You're acting for someone else and you have responsibility to them. So anytime that you're selling out of an estate, I think it makes it, a, it, makes it more complicated. One of the... Um, one of the um, sort of rules of the fiduciary of a personal representative of an estate is that you are required to get the highest price for the property. And this can create some issues uh, for buyers and sellers because you'll see 
the seller's attorney who's representing the personal representative will put in the purchase and sale agreement that we can get rid of this deal and go to another deal if we get a better offer. And of course, the buyers don't want to see that, but the, the sellers are putting that in there to protect that personal representative who could otherwise be sued by the beneficiaries for breaching their fiduciary duty. Um, so for that reason and many other reasons, um, many people put their properties in trust during their lifetimes so that their house is not in their probate estate and they don't have to worry about those types of issues, selling out of an estate. There's often a lot of title issues when you're selling out of an estate, things that come up at the last minute that you know delay the deal um, and make everyone very unhappy. So a lot of people put their property in trust, but then they have questions. Well, if my house is in trust when, and I want to sell my house, what, what does that mean? Do, do I have any issues doing that? And for the most part, I would say it depends. Um, so <laughs> for, for many people who put their house into what's known as a revocable living trust, which is a trust, say I create a trust, I call it the Suzanne Sayward Trust, it's my trust. Um, I'm the grantor beneficiary, I'm the trustee. If I wanna sell my house that's in my trust, I just do it. Um, I, I sign the deed as the trustee, I get a check payable to me as the trustee, I put it into my trust account, I report it on my personal income tax return. So there's, there's really not too, too many complications. Um, in Massachusetts, for many, many years, we held real estate in what was called a nominee realty trust. And we still do that, often for married couples when we're, we're doing tax planning. So a nominee real estate trust is a little bit of a peculiar animal in that it's not a real traditional trust. And if your house is in a nominee realty trust and you're going to sell it, you can still do that. You are still the beneficiary. But the key there is to make arrangements in advance for the proceeds check to come to you as the beneficiary and not to you as the trustee of your nominee realty trust, because chances are you do not have an account opened in the name of your nominee realty trust. And when you get a check that says, sue as trustee of her nominee realty trust, you cannot deposit it anywhere other than to an account opened in the name of the nominee realty trust. So it, it's good to, in advance, see what you have and, and what you might need to do to make sure that you don't have these glitches at the last minute and have to go back and say, oh, I need a different check or, or whatever. Um, now, if you have an irrevocable trust, so a trust that you've created primarily because you want to preserve your property from being subject to that mass health lien that Adam had referred to, so let me just take a little side trip here and, and talk a little bit about that. So MassHealth is the agency in Massachusetts that administers the Medicaid program. Medicaid, not to be confused with Medicare, Medicare is that great health insurance that we all wanna have. Medicaid is that state and federally funded program that will pay for medical costs, including long-term nursing home care for individuals who are both medically and financially eligible because the cost of long-term care is so expensive and many people want to try to preserve some of their assets for the benefit of their family, they will sometimes create an irrevocable trust. Very common to put your home into that irrevocable trust, wait out the five-year ineligibility period, after which if you need to apply for mass health benefits to pay for your long-term nursing home care, you might be eligible. Likely mass health will tell you your trust is no good and then you'll fight about it and, and hopefully you'll win. But you know, it, you, you start off with the idea being that you're going to protect the property. So now here I am, my house is in an irrevocable trust. It's been there for more than five years. It's protected in case I need nursing home care, but now, mm, I don't really wanna live there anymore. I wanna go live somewhere else. Can my house be sold and what happens then? Well, for the most part, yes, that the house can be sold, but the money is going to be in this irrevocable trust, which can't be distributed to me. And maybe that's okay, 
the money in the trust could be used to buy a condo for me to live in or to buy into assisted living if that's what I wanted to do, but it all has to be done within the context of this irrevocable trust. So that, that's important to understand. Um, there can also be some, some income tax um, consequences to be aware of when you're selling property out of an irrevocable trust. Uh, you may know that when you sell your home, you get to exclude up to $250,000 of capital gain on the sale. What does that mean? Okay, so say I bought my house for $100,000 25 years ago, and now it's worth $500,000. So when I sell it, I have a gain of $400,000 that is taxable. If I'm a single person, I can exclude 250,000 of that gain, meaning I only need to pay the tax on the difference, 150. If I'm married, I can exclude $500,000 of the gain and zero tax would need to be paid. So that is a very sweet deal. And you definitely wanna be able to take advantage of that if you can. So when you create your irrevocable trust to preserve your home from the mass health lien, you wanna make sure that you would also draft it or have it prepared for you in a way that would allow you to take advantage of those capital gain exclusion on the sale of the primary residence. Um, let's see, do you, do, you, do you guys have any questions that you see come up for clients who have their homes and trusts or selling out of an estate or conservatorship that uh, you think would be of interest to our attendees? No, usually if we run into this, we have the attorney really help us to answer those kinds of questions because it can be multiple layers. So nothing comes yeah. I don't to wanna give mind. misinformation. Yeah. So we do usually refer them back to their, um, you know, attorney, their accountant, their financial planner, whoever is you helping them um, yep. on that side. So incapacity is probably something that you run across, Adam. Um, you know, the owner of the home maybe no longer has the capacity to sign the deed, right? So, you know, in, in those circumstances, if, if someone has done some estate planning and they have a durable power of attorney in place that says, I name my spouse, my child, my niece, whoever, to be my attorney in fact, and I grant her the authority to sell my home and sign a deed. Well, in that case, if the owner of the home is incapacitated, you've got somebody in place who can stand in her shoes and take care of things. In cases where that hasn't happened, then what needs to um, happen in order for the house to be sold is someone needs to go to the probate court and petition for a conservatorship, which is a, like a guardianship, but has to do with financial matters. And then you have to ask the court if you can please sell the house. So that, you know, being in probate when you're dead is bad. Being in probate when you're alive is even worse. So you want to take all steps you can to never have to be faced with a conservatorship through the probate court. Um, and doing a little bit of estate planning, making sure you have a power of attorney or a trust in place so that's not gonna happen. But um, have you ever, Adam, been in a situation where somebody, where people get to the table and they're like, wait a minute, you can't, or get very close to the closing and it's, wait a minute, you can't, you can't sell this house. You, there's nobody to sign the deed. You need a conservatorship. And now months go by. Um, so this is um, reality TV quality material. Um, so it's amazing how many people think they're authorized to sell and that they're the client. And truly, they have no power. And you have to be so amazingly cautious about who you talk to and is that person, do they have the ability to sign and is their signature valid? I am never 
going to give someone a mini mental. There are way too many other professionals that need to get involved to determine competency. Um, I've, I haven't been fooled, but it's come close a couple of times where a child has told me, oh, don't, she's fine, sharp as a tack, nothing to worry about. Um, and one time I, it was actually, it was kind of disturbing. I had to go to the hospital for proof of life mm. uh, the day of closing um, when it came to light that it wasn't as presented. Uh, that was a low point. <laughs> I hope not to repeat that. But I have seen instances where contracts are signed or contracts are not signed, which is even worse. And properties hit the MLS with mm. unsigned contracts. Right. Um, not cool. <laughs> it's, um, you know what, there's just no shortage of stupid people. And as I said in the beginning, getting a license, it's a license to ruin someone's life. If you do not verify who the actual client is, along with the set of rules. I can't tell you how many times I'm not allowed to speak to certain siblings or family members. Now, whether the other family members talk among themselves, I have no control over, but you know, the liability is, it's crazy. So you, you owe it to yourself and to your client to drill down. If there's a DPOA, I need to see that. I, 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 I need to verify I, I want to trust you, but, uh, you know, uh, I wasn't a giant fan of Ronald Reagan, but trust but verify. I, I need to see the proof because it's strictly, it's going to blow up at the closing table. And now we have a 360 degree, you know what, it's just the yeah. stuff. Yeah, yeah, we definitely don't, we definitely don't want, want that. Um, so we've, we've come to our, our seven o'clock hour with our, we've, we've got our 20 minutes each. We've, we've spent our time and um, see so at least one question there. But before I move on to the questions, I want to give each of you the opportunity to maybe talk about something that I didn't ask a question for since I forced you to answer my questions that you would like to <laughs> share with uh, share with the attendees and, and really get out there uh, that you think it's it would be important for people to know. So um, Ellen and Janice, why don't you go first? So, I mean, I think that one of the things that just meeting the three of us, um, everyone can see is that there's different, you know, levels of how real estate works based on who you're working with, um, what are you, where are you buying, where are you selling, et cetera. Be, be smart talk to people, don't read everything that you, you know, don't say everything on the internet is true. Um, ask for referrals, meet with others and be, and get educated. Um, this is a very challenging business as Adam alluded. It's easy to get your license. It's not easy to be successful. Um, and it's really important to be educated. There's so much misinformation out there. Um, and, you know, work with trust people that you trust, that you like, they make you laugh, and um, that know what they're doing is, I think, something to take away from this. That's good advice. Yeah. Adam, you want to share some pearls of wisdom? Um, that was my mom's name, Pearl. <laughs> <laughs> See that, Ma? Um, I, I, I would want to just tell the universal maxim, that no matter what condition your property is in, it has never been worth more than right now. And the biggest obstacle that I have found in my life that holds people back, and real estate is no different, is fear. It's fear of the unknown, it's fear of making a mistake, it's fear of something new, fear of being criticized. Getting to the point that you can address your fear and take that next step to visit with Sue, get your papers done, put in the legwork. <laughs> I just, I can't, because I've seen it go smoothly and I've seen it go incredibly badly. The secret is doing the work, getting a trusted safety net around you of professionals who listen and give you quality guidance. That's very good advice as well. Thank you, Adam. <laughs> Let me see what we have for our question. 
Okay, so it's a question on the $500,000 exclusion for a couple selling a home in an irrevocable trust. Is the capital gains after the costs with closing and selling the house, the realtor for et cetera? Uh, yes. So when you're determining the capital gains that you have on the sale of property, you get to deduct the expenses related to the sale before you come to that final, that net, uh, that net uh, capital gain number. So the answer to that is yes. Very good question. Thank you. Um, and I think that's all that we have for our questions. So I will wrap up and thank our panelists so much for participating. You guys were great. And anybody who wants to learn more about um, Ellen and Janice and Adam and reach out to them or think they could be help them, please do so. The link to their websites was in the invitation that you got. If for some reason you don't have that or you can't find it, you can come back to me um, and we're happy to share that with you. We got one more question. Oh, if somebody wants to know, Pat's following up about whether or not the, a new repair, uh, whether or not repairs for a new, question, a new kitchen, for example, would that be um, part of the capital gain? And yes, that would add to the basis of the house. So you would add that on there. Sorry to get derailed there. But again, uh, you can learn more about Ellen and Janice and Adam um, via their websites. Um, if you have follow-up questions, please feel free to reach out to us. We're happy to get back to you. Um, keep watching your email for our articles and our newsletters and for our next Smart Council program, which will be in October, um, again, on the probate process. All right. Thank, Thank you. you, everyone, Thank and you. have Thank a great you. night. You, you too. too. Thanks, Thanks so much. Suzanne. Thanks, Suzanne. Bye now. Bye-bye.